Welcome to another day as we begin a new journey today as we go through the book of Esther, a wonderful book, one of my favorites in the Old Testament. And uh, looking forward to just kind of going through this wonderful book with you. I uh, want to read to you some comments from the New King James St Study Bible, which I love and uh, just love the way it kind of paints the picture of the book of Esther. So I just want to read that to you as we start. The book of Esther has all the elements of a great novel. There is the beautiful young orphan girl who rises from obscurity to become queen. She even hides a secret that could bring about her own demise. Then there is the ambitious villain whose passion is to destroy the innocent. Finally, the storyline involves a power struggle, romantic love, and a startling expose. But in the end, in the end, the point of this true story is clear. Once again, the Israelites, God miraculously saves his people from certain destruction. Uh, the identity and the author of the book of Esther is actually unknown. Uh, whoever they were was most likely Jewish because it's written from a very Jewish perspective and they probably lived in Persia, which is modern day Iran. Um, whoever the author was, the book of Esther was probably written very shortly after the end of the reign of Ahasuerus, uh, no earlier than 465 BC. Um, the, the author writes about the rule of Ahasuerus, uh, the deeds of Mordecai in the past tense. In other words, they've already happened. So uh, th there's some interesting points there about how it's written. Um, and a little bit of historical background, the events of Esther take about a decade to cover. And they, uh, through the reign of King Ahasuerus, who is also known by the name Xerxes, King Xerxes, um, who succeeded his father Darius as the ruler of the Persian Empire in 486 BC. And again, that's the, the part of uh, center of what we would call modern day Iran, but it was much bigger than just modern day Iran. It was an empire and it was an enormous empire. Uh, during his reign, uh, Ahasuerus continued his father's campaign against Greece, um, and it was and it didn't really go well. <laughs> um, and so, so we, 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 that's the kind of historical background that we have. Um, the The Book of Esther gives us some clarity that um, it's okay sometimes to hide your identity. And, and we're going to get to that as we go through it. But it's not about us hiding our identity because we're scared or it was all part of God's plan to be revealed at a certain time. She used her Persian name, uh, Ishtar or Esther. They, those are the two Persian names. And her actual name was Hadassah, which is talked about in the book. And the Really, the, the climax of the story is about her revelation as a Jew. She keeps it for so long in the story, and you keep waiting. When's she going to tell somebody? And when she does it, it's at the perfect time. And it, this is a very important book because there's a lot of unique characteristics of the book of Esther. For example, the name of God is not written in the book of Esther anyway. Anywhere, the God, not the name Yahweh, God, nothing. And there's a couple of possible explanations to do with this. The first is that it could be the author's chosen point of view. He didn't uh, feel that it needed to be in there. Uh, the author might have actually written this book as a Jew in the form of a chronicle for the Empire of Persia in order to explain to the Persians in generations to come why the Jews would celebrate this particular time, which is now called Purim, P-U-R-I-M. And in accordance with that particular style, the, the author, a, a chronicled style, if you like, the author emphasizes the king's name, his title, style, um, his lists, uh, but kind of writes about the Jewish people in almost a detached tone. 
and which is how the New King James Study Bible puts it. So it's a very interesting book. Now, one of the things that I always like to look at books in the Old Testament when you're going through them is what are the types of Jesus? What's a type? A type is somebody who gives us an idea of the character of Jesus that is going to come. Not that Jesus is a character, but what his character was going to be like. Okay? Um, and Esther puts herself in harm's way, just like Jesus did. did. She did it for her people, just like Jesus did. She is attempting to be an advocate for her people, like Jesus was. And the similarities to the mission of Esther and the mission of Jesus are very closely aligned. Her rise to power was orchestrated by God at an appointed time, just like Jesus. For such a time as this is recorded in Esther chapter 4. And the Apostle Paul said the same thing about Jesus. He said that yeah, you have come uh, when the fullness of time has arrived. Another similarity between Esther and Jesus is that they, were, they both were subject to satanic attacks from the devil uh, and plots from the devil to try to destroy what God was doing through both of them. But in both case, cases, Esther and Jesus, God brought about a victory because that's what he had predetermined was going to happen. And God always has an eternal purpose. And Esther just needed to do her thing, and so did Jesus. So that's what we have as we go through the book. So let's get into it. Esther chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, and there, there are multiple ways to pronounce his name. Some people call him Ahasuerus. Uh, uh, Ahasuerus. Uh, there's, uh, there's a Hebrew way to pronounce it, which I'm not even going to attempt, but we're going to call him Ahasuerus. Um, now, he reigned, this uh, Ahasuerus, over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel. Now, did you know India was in the Bible? How many times have you read the Bible and not realized India was in the Bible? There you go. India to Ethiopia. If you get out a world map and look at how far it is from India to Ethiopia, you'll see how Im massively enormous this empire actually was. And this is 3,000 years ago. Ah, uh, 2,500. I got a little excited. 2,500 years ago. So, this king is very well known to history. He's actually uh, better known as King Xerxes than he is as Ahasuerus. And as I mentioned before, he inherited this incredibly large empire, the Persian Empire from his father, who is mentioned in Ezra chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, Daniel chapter 6, uh, Haggai chapter 1, chapter 2. And where everything happens in the book of Esther, all the, the, the machinations of the story took place in a palace that has been discovered in Susa in Iran. And you can actually go there and visit it if you could get to Iran right now. Uh, and uh, the archaeologists have, have matched word for word the story of the book of Esther to the way that the palace was set up. No doubt whatsoever that that is the place. Absolutely amazing. Now, Ahasuerus was planning a doomed invasion of Greece, which was going to take, uh, take place a, a few years later during this particular story, though. And at the time, the city of Athens was uh, celebrating, believe it or not, its 79th Olympic Games at this particular time. And the Persian Empire was the largest empire the world had ever seen at the time of this story. Now, it covered everywhere from Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, Jordan, Lebanon, modern-day Israel, uh, Egypt, Sudan, Libya, Arabia. I mean, it was enormous, absolutely enormous. Now, also at this time, uh, Ezra had actually returned to Jerusalem after it had been conquered by the Babylonians. 
and the temple had been rebuilt. Remember, it had been destroyed, and then they were sent back to go and rebuild it. And then, of course, Nehemiah had to go back years later and actually build the wall. Um, and when the temple was rebuilt, so this is the second temple, it was not rebuilt to the same glorious uh, dimensions and the way that Solomon had originally built it. Um, so about 40 years after Ahasuerus, it was when Nehemiah was going to go to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls of the city. So what does he do? Let's read about what King Ahasuerus was now going to do in those days. I always love that when it says in those days. That in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all of his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all. And when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Shushan, the citadel, from great to small in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white and blue linen curtains, which is interesting, I'm going to talk about that later, fastened with cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods and marble pillars, and the couches were of gold and silver in a mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise and white and black marble. I mean, this is just an amazing picture, right? And this is what they found in Susa in Iran, all this. Uh, they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other, with royal wine in abundance, according to the generosity of the king. And in accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory. For so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure. Queen Vashti also made a feast for the women in the royal palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. So first feast lasts for six months and is for all the government officials. And that one, you know, that's where they get it. So the, all the government people get this massive feast. The people who are just the people, they get a seven-day feast. Uh, sound, does it sound like anything's changed in a couple of thousand years? Right. Um, and the basic reason for these, these feasts were this. It's just a hazardous showing off. That's all it is. He just wants to impress everybody with his wealth and his power and his generosity. And uh, he would have used public money to pay for it. Now, interestingly enough, I talked about there were white and blue linen curtains. In the original Hebrew, it actually doesn't say white and blue linen curtains. It says there was white and blue stuff. <laughs> Literally, that's what it says if you were to, if you were to uh, explain it, which gives us a little bit of a glimpse. Here's why this is important, because it gives us a bit of a glimpse into the fact that it was most likely a man that wrote the book of Esther because a woman's eye may have been a little different. She might have written uh, a little bit more about what that actually was uh, from a decorating detail perspective. Now, also, uh, we note here, in accordance with the law, drinking was not compulsory. Now, this was something that could only happen if the king said so, because it was normal practice that if uh, wine was served by the king, you had to drink it, unless he gave you the ability to choose for yourself. And that's what he said at the second feast, everybody could do as they pleased. Interestingly enough, there's a third feast, so the six months feast for the government officials. There's the seven day feast for the people in the city. Then there's also another feast going on at the same time at the end of it with Queen Vashti for the women. And this is in the royal palace. Now, Queen Vashti is, she's really about to play a big part here. So on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry. So this is at the end of the seventh day of the seven-day feast. So you've had the eight, the six-month one. Now you've got the seven-day one. We're at the seventh day. The king was merry with wine. In other words, he was drunk. And he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abigtha, Zethar, and Carcass, seven eunuchs who served in the presence of a king Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials, for she was beautiful to behold. Now, according to Jewish tradition, this request from the king to the eunuchs, go and get Vashti, I want to show her off. It happened because there was an argument at the feast about 
which country had the most beautiful women. And Ahasuerus decided to settle this by saying, listen, you've got to take a look at my wife and then we won't have to talk about it anymore. And she was beautiful to behold. The, the, the implication, even though it's not specifically said, was that she would display herself in an immodest way to make herself appear even more beautiful. But Vashti throws a little bit of a spanner in the works here. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command brought by his eunuchs. Therefore, the king was furious and his anger burned within him. Now, she was not a follower of the God of Israel, but she had enough wisdom and modesty to know that what the king had asked her to do was something she should not do. So the king was mad, livid. So all of a sudden, the queen, Queen Vashti, finds herself in a very dangerous situation. She didn't put herself in that situation. She wasn't even at that, this banquet. She was at the other banquet for the women. So it wasn't like she, you know, it was her fault as to why she you know, was in this situation at all. It wasn't through any lack of wisdom on her part. Uh, and so she decided to make a stance. And Adam Clark says this about her. What woman possessing even a common share of prudence and modesty could consent to expose herself to the view of such a group of drunken Bacchalanians. Her courage was equal to her modesty. She would resist the royal mandate rather than violate the rules of chaste decorum. Hail, noble woman. <laughs> I love that. I think that's very well written by Adam Clark. So let's move on. Verse 13. Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for this was the king's manner toward all who knew law and justice, those closest to him being Karshina, Shetha, Admatha, Tarshish, Merez, Marsena, and Memukan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who had access to the king's presence and who ranked highest in the kingdom. What shall we do to Queen Vashti according to the law? Because she did not obey the command of King Ahasuerus brought to her by the eunuchs. And Memukan answered before the king and the princes, Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also all the princes and all the people who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will become known to all women so that they will despise their husbands in their eyes when they report King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she did not come. This very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Media will say to all the king's officials that they have heard of the behavior of the queen. Thus, there will be excessive contempt and wrath. And if it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out for him and let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it will not be altered, that Vashti shall come no more before King Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. And when the king's decree, which he will make, is proclaimed throughout all the empire, for it is great, his empire, all wives will honour their husbands, both great and small. And the reply pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Memukan. And then he sent letters to all the king's provinces, to each province in its own script, and to every people in their own language, that each man should be master in his own house and speak in the language of his own people. So, what does King, King Ahasuerus do? He listens to Memukan and he shows himself to be very unreasonable and flat out wrong. He should have honoured the dignity of his queen and realised that she was actually protecting him, but he didn't do that. And history's recollection of King Ahasuerus shows him to be a very foolish man. He did a lot of foolish things. Just he had, A man had no wisdom. And he did a lot of things that were unreasonable. For example, uh, this is written in, in historical uh, records. There was one particular occasion when um, some people were building a bridge for him. And it was destroyed by a storm, an ocean storm. So he commanded, I kid you not, that the water and the waves be whipped and chained to punish the sea. Yeah, this guy's not playing with the full deck. Let me just tell you that. 
He was drunk with power, not just with wine. So, what does he say? Every man should be the master of his own house. Now, the purpose of the harsh treatment of Vashti was so that she wouldn't set a bad example for other women. So Ahasuerus wanted to reinforce the idea of man's leadership in the home because they were all afraid but because of Vashti's example that basically women everywhere would just despise their husbands and there'd be chaos uh, because of all the excessive contempt and wrath. And I, I guess you could say the goal here was admirable, like we can't have chaos. Um, but if every man was leading his home the way that he was meant to, according to God's covenant, which is preferring his wife, treating her like the princess that she is, and protecting and providing and being the king and priest of his home, uh, and, and deferring to her and doing whatever he can and setting her up to win like a Proverbs 31 woman, then there wouldn't be a problem. But it does remind us that Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5, let the wife see that she respects her husband. But that comes out of how the husband treats the wife. And sometimes it's very difficult for that to, to happen because a, a wife's respect is really the most precious gift she can give to her husband, but his love for her is his most precious gift. And it means here that what King Ahasuerus was trying to achieve was foolish. Because you can't demand respect from your wife. If it's not freely given, then it's not really true respect. It's just fear of punishment. And, and this is what Ahasuerus was going to learn. So observation from our intro and uh, going through chapter one right now. Uh, I love how the story starts with a woman, Queen Vashti, defying the power drunk husband who just wants to show her off. And she says, not on your Nelly. That's an Australian term. No way, I'm not doing it. I'm not gonna make a fool of me or you. That is just not going to happen. So she sets the stage for a pretty awesome story. So uh, what, what are your observations from this opening salvo in chapter one of the book of Esther? Let me know in the comments below. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful story that just helps us understand that God, no matter what circumstances are going on and how intricate they are, you're always in the middle of them. In Jesus' name, amen.